I'd like to welcome everybody to the West Virginia Archives and History Tuesday Evening Lecture Series. Some of our upcoming lectures is this coming Thursday night will be Don't Cuss Me, Saloons, Liquor, and Gunplay, and West Virginia's Early Coal Camps <coughs> by Dr. Paul Rakes. That's coming up this Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Then uh, August 22nd, uh, Six Voices. Six short stories about West Virginia glass. The voices are going to be uh, by uh, Billy Cody, Dave Bush, Dane Woody Moore, Dottie Dottery, Dean Six, and Tom Fell. That's at six o'clock also. I'd like uh, for our upcoming lectures, uh, please refer to our website. Uh, and also make sure that we have your email if you want to receive uh, news blasts about our lectures as, that are coming up. Uh, we're planning our uh, 2014 lecture schedule, so please let us know if you have any suggestions as to topics that you'd like to see presented. <clears throat> we're planning for the first Tuesday and third Thursday of each month for our lecture day. So if you have any topics that you'd like to see presented or hear presented, uh, just let us know. And, try to arrange the speakers for those. This evening, uh, Jerry Sutton will present West Virginia Rivers, Steamboats, and River Improvements. The invention and development of the Western River Steamboats set the stage for America's Industrial Revolution, which transformed the United States and West Virginia. Mr. Sutton will make a Benjamin presentation on West Virginia rivers that were improved due to the invention and development of the Western River Steamboat. He will discuss how steam packets, towboats, ferries, and showboats impacted citizens and the growth of our state. Mr. Sutton will, is recognized as one of the United States' foremost inland rivers and river transportation historians. Since working for the Huntington District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for 20 years, he has been the owner-operator of a visual communication arts company for two decades and specializes as a consultant in the research, development, and presentation of inland river projects such as museum exhibits, publications, and motion picture productions. Please wel welcome Mr. Stephan. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's nice to see a nice turnout like this on a warm summer evening. Uh, hopefully you will enjoy what I have to present. What I'll be addressing, of course, will be navigation in the Western Rivers. When we refer to Western Rivers, I think we always have to take in mind that we're talking about any river west of the Appalachian chain. That term, Western Rivers, was uh, first used early in our history as a nation and has been used up to this point. Now, if you run anybody in California or any place like that, they'll have contests with you about Western rivers, but we were the first and true Western rivers. In doing this uh, presentation, as I have done with others, I think it's very important that I try to uh, let you understand and know the importance of river, na river navigation and transportation within the United States, and particularly in the state of West Virginia. When you stop and you think about it, the western frontier that we often hear so much about was not uh, actually di discovered or developed by wagon trains or people like that. They followed the river, and following the river, they went along the route that took them to the southwest, then to the west, from the Appalachian chain all the way to the foothills of the Rockies. Riverboats, steamboats, and pioneers were the ones who developed this nation. And in so doing, they changed the nation as well. They brought business, they brought transportation, but they also did a great deal to change cultures and to mix cultures in doing this. So tonight, hopefully, uh, we'll take a look at photographs. Uh, I have to do everything visually. My entire thought process is visually, so I can't just talk or, or write. I have to see it when I do it. So in doing that tonight, I hope you will enjoy the, uh, the illustrations you will see, and it will help you understand the importance of both rivers their improvements, and the boats that ran upon them.
as with all AV equipment, it's waiting for something to go wrong. <laughs> This is the United States in 1776. And as you look at it, you begin to realize that it was a small nation at that point, with 13 colonies, all lining the eastern seaboard. One thing I'd like for you to take a look at here, uh, in doing this, the King of England had decided that this would be the colonies or the English colony in America. And he did a Volunteer, well, actually, he mandated that no one could pass this imaginary line right here at the crest of the Appalachian Mountains. And, of course, you and our forefathers didn't pay much attention to kings, as we learned later. But anyway, crossing imaginary lines was not even in their vocabulary, so they didn't worry about that at all. Knowing this, this was the western side of this, and this is where we are tonight. When we begin to talk about the rivers, the role they play, and how significant they were in the nation's development. Uh, it's, it's been a minor sore spot with me throughout most of my life doing this stuff is that our nation has failed to recognize the role of the rivers and what they played in the development of this nation, and particularly in our educational system. Uh, I don't know that anyone has a PhD in river navigation history, and I don't think I ever will, but nonetheless, I think it's very important that they do have one, they understand this role because they predated most other modes of transportation in the country. <coughs> so tonight, we're going to talk about West Virginia and its role in all this national movement. To do this, I think it, all of us understand the state and basically how the state is laid out. This little panhandle that I learned in grade school extends out to the northeast. All those rivers flow into the Potomac and therefore are not really a part of this state, really. However, if you look on the other side, they all flow back into the Ohio. And this is significant, not only for the state of West Virginia, for the Ohio as well. If the Mississippi is the father of waters, then the Ohio is the mother of waters. And you'll understand why if you start studying American history and begin to see how much role they played in all of that we were doing. Our first river we'll try to look at is the Ohio because it is the major river of the state. In so doing, we begin to understand how it, how it all happened. And to do this, we have to understand that the first boats, the first vessels on there, basically were the Native American canoes and log, log rafts and things like that. But as soon as the Americans, which I like to call them, the immigrants came from Europe, they began to create means of maneuvering on the river because this was very significantly important to them. We were a very much agricultural country then, and we had to have products. And we were so rich in producing these items, we had to find a market for it. And unfortunately, when you start looking at this, you realize that all the farmers were trading with one another, so they didn't have much to trade to gain by, but they began to ship it downriver. And when they got as far as New Orleans, they could really unload this great production of produce that they would then ship other places or use in the South. To do this, they developed two immediate boats. One was the flat boat, which was little more than a rectangular box, sealed up waterproof, and was rough cut timber. They would flip it into the river, load it with produce of multitude size, from animals to anything you can think of that you could grow, and molasses and other things like that, and sail off down the river during good river conditions. Once they reached their destination, this particular vessel all the items were sold off of it, and then it was disassembled, and they were used for building materials all along the river, whether it be the Mississippi or the Lower Ohio. The other one you see, both of these are called keel boats, K-E-L-L, K-E-E-L boats. Uh, with my West Virginia accent, you know, most people think I'm saying something other than keel. But uh, with, with this, you see that this boat was made like an oversized canoe, really, except it did have a keel that ran completely under the whole boat kind of like an ocean-going vessel. The interesting part about this was, where this one had a one-way trip, this one was the first attempt to have two-way navigation and transportation on the rivers. They built these boats with shark valves on both ends, and they used these to go downstream very easily. They could float like the flatboats did. But coming back became another task. 
They would go as far south as New Orleans, load up with things like uh, some products that we didn't have here, sugar and other things, and start back up river. And to do this, they had four to six men walk along gunnels along the side of the boat on both sides, setting 12 to 14 foot pipe poles in the bottom of the river and pushing it up. So they literally walked the boat back upstream. On the Canal River, this was not unusual at all because they were doing this with salt. And to do this, they would walk 90 miles back up the Canal River to get back where they were going. They tried to use sails and other means of uh, propulsion, but it didn't work because there's no prevailing winds out there. This went on actually even after the steamboat era was there. Uh, I always tell everyone looking at this, the, the most interesting part about this whole thing was this guy right here, he played music to keep them in uh, rhythm as they walked along the gunnels. And this would be the job I would apply to. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have been very good at sticking that pipe pole on the ground and pushing on it. In 1811, a very unusual thing happened. A group of New York investors decided they would build, actually in 1809 in New York, and built a steamboat. It was the first commercially successful steamboat. Now, as a West Virginian, I give James Rubensey credit for the development of steamboats as well, who George Washington thought was a good thing. His was a little different. It was more like a water propulsion boat, like we have the jet skis today. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't have the wing, wings or means or wherewithal to turn it into a, a commercially successful boat. But a group in New Orleans, New York, did. There was James Rumsey. I mean, I'm sorry, James uh, Fulton, Robert Fulton, and Livingston and Roosevelt, and they were the ones who first successfully created a commercially successful steamboat. But they had their eye on the western rivers the whole time. So in 1811, actually 1810, they came to Pittsburgh, where they found they built the first western river steamboat. What you're looking at here is an 1810 watercolor painting done by Robert Fulton, who was an artist, by the way, as well as a, a tinker of uh, steamboats. And uh, he did this wash in 1810. It's in the possession of the US Naval Academy. And when I found out about it, I was very much challenged because we were trying to determine in 2011 what the first steamboat looked like. And I was working on a committee out of Hanover College, and we could not find any illustrations or even a description that really fulfilled this. And I stumbled on this image in a book, or one like it. So I called the Naval Academy and asked them, and a the lady there was extremely, extremely helpful. She said, that's okay, I'll make you prints and send them to you. And this was one done in 1810. So I feel very strongly that this is probably what the first Western River Steamboat looked like, what the New Orleans looked like. It was named for its namesake city that it would be going to. I'm sorry. This set off a, a revolution and an evolution of steamboats that you cannot imagine. This is an 1820 painting of made of New Orleans at New Orleans. But this boat was actually built in New Jersey. Float down the uh, intercoastal waterway along the Atlantic coast, ended up in New Orleans, and it was on its way to St. Louis. Beautiful painting. This is the Yellowstone 1834 painting that was done by George Catlett. And this boat really shows what was happening in the evolution of the building of the boats. You'll notice it's totally different in that it does have side wheels, but it also has cabins above it. It's passing St. Louis, Missouri, on its way to the Yellowstone, to the Missouri River, and up to the Yellowstone. This is very interesting because it's an 1842 wash of some of the earlier steamboats, and this was just above Wheeling. But you'll notice now that the boat is very close to shore. It has a flat bottom hull. It has cabins built above this where most of the boat is above water. And it has a stage out or a landing board out. This really depicts what the steamboat had evolved to in probably 20, 25 years. But this was the pattern that future steamboats would all follow. Most of them have flat hulls. They would have uh, cabins above it. And this is where the passengers stayed. This was the cargo area. 
What you're looking at now is actually three of eight panels. This is the earliest known photograph of Western River Steamboat. It's at Cincinnati, Ohio. There are eight daguerreotypes that were taken by two gentlemen on the Newport side of Kentucky of the West Virginia, of the Cincinnati shore. And it's remarkable detail on this thing. It's unbelievable, as a matter of fact. They have just, uh, last two, three years ago, had the uh, eight panel uh, copper plates all redone by Kodak Institute. And they are beautiful, absolutely stunning. If you get a close up of this, you'll see what the boats looked like then. From 1942, I mean 1842 to 1834, 38, you'll notice they were virtually the same. Flat bottom hull, side wheels, cabins, pilot house. This was called the Texas. They were making evolutions at that point about what was decks and what they were called. This is where the crew stayed on the boat. This set in them to production an unbelievable amount of things were happening at this period. The boats were so important that all of a sudden building them, having them, was a remarkable thing. It wasn't just the packet boats they were building, it was towboats. This is a very early towboat. You'll notice it doesn't even have towing knees on it, which you see on the modern towboats today. But it's pretty rough looking, but it was done just for that purpose. It was pushed these barges. It was not a passenger carrier, and therefore it did not need to be dressed up. This is what it did. It pushed fleets of barges up and down the river, predominantly filled with coal at this time, because the industrial revolution was just beginning, and coal was the fuel that fired that revolution. They opened boat yards to build these boats with, which became another business within the states within the, along the river. And they had huge ones. This is Madison, Indiana. You'll notice there's four boats here, two here, and a whole new hull being laid right here. This was when steamboats were hot at their peak, and everybody was building them, and everybody was using them, and all the rivers had them. They were building ferry boats, all of wood, very highly crafted, very effective. They were also making ingenious changes in the steam propulsion systems of these boats, as well as the metal technology of the day was improving because of they were making boilers and machinery parts. This is at Huntington. You'll notice it's a, a regular standard ferry. There's a carriage on board here. This is right now at Nice Street. You're looking across the Ohio River. This is from a glass plate negative I have, which is a beautiful photography. And they were building show boats. This is the Price's new floating opera. This is a very early boat on there, and they would trail, trail along the river, float along the river and end up going from town to town putting on presentations, which they would charge for, of course. This one floated down the river until it reached its destination, and then it would hitch a ride back upstream. Whereas later, showboats were pushed by towboats. They would take them all along the smaller rivers, up and down, putting on plays and putting on presentations. This became a major industry, and the Kanawha Valley, by the way, was one of the major sources of not only having these, but also where they produced the plays. And believe it or not, they took circuses around him because, just keep in mind, this was more the era of mass uh, media entertainment. And so they floated around these project, these areas, putting on shows for all, including slow, small plays, but also carrying menageries and putting on circuses, on three-ring or two-ring circuses on a floating barge. And believe it or not, this is a junk boat. And you notice how well it's built, and it has a proper name on it, the Queen City. It was 1898, and they were carrying junk. There were a whole fleet of these boats. They would do junk boat, dish boats, other boats, trade boats of all kinds, floated up and down the river. And they carried on the trains like that. It was never ending, the amount of things that could be done on a boat back then, for all the people who were enterprising enough to try it. Floating photo galleries. And I give thanks almost daily for these guys because if without these guys, you wouldn't see what I'm showing you tonight. But they would go along and take pictures of families, of farms, of animals, of people, but they also took great pride in photographing the boats. Of all the modes of transportation I know of, there are more photographs of steamboats or river boats than anything I have ever known of. From snapshots to formal portraits, they took pictures of river boats. Even umbrella makers took it on themselves to, to go out and market a little bit on the river, if you can believe that. And there were floating chapels because, you know, you had to get the word out, no matter where you were or with whom. 
You'll notice this right here is a floating chapel. Uh, a father, mother, and two daughters actually ran this thing for about four years, and they had a floating chapel, which they, they converted. And many times they would have their own baptisms right beside the river. So this was not uncommon for the river to play a central role in almost everything going on in any community or any town along the river. But the riverfront was always busy. There were always packets coming and going. There were small ones. There were large ones coming and going, carrying on trades. The only thing that was a real hindrance in all this primarily was the fact that when the river got low, which it did seasonally, it really got low. Here you see a low water packet boat, the Greendale, built specifically to run on low water. In the Ohio, you'll notice this gravel bank, this gravel bank. This is the Ohio River. And the Kanoa would get this low also. Rivers like all rivers today were very seasonal. So the government got involved in both state and local and federal about trying to create dredge out channels on the river so that they could carry on their trades year round because when the boats stopped running, the economy stopped dead. So to do this, they began to dredge out channels. This is up near Wheeling. Uh, they are getting dredge out channels so they could have, try to have year round navigation. But of course, this didn't always work. And eventually, in 1884, the federal government took over the operation of the rivers and began to develop a series of locks and dams. You're looking at the Senator Cordell packet boat in a lock chamber, and over here is the dam. These were wickets, actually 12, 14 foot flat boards that stuck up in the river, and they could be raised and lowered to create open river navigation through here if the river was high enough. They built 46 of them on the Ohio River from Pittsburgh to Cairo in 1929. Started in 1884. In 1929, they completed it. And the unfortunate part about that was they left Pittsburgh on October the 29th, 1929, the same day the stock market crashed. However, a little sidelight about that. The Depression came and caused a great deal of chaos, but navigation and, and, and commerce <coughs> on the Ohio River actually increased during the uh, Depression because of the loss of names. And this is what it looked like after the locks and dams were going. The boats could carry on a standard schedule, stay on schedule pretty much. This is at Catlinsburg, Kentucky. You'll notice the big packet boats landed and several small ones coming out of the big Sandy River. And we'll get to that a little later. But these locks and dams also did a great to create more development, industrial development along the river. And here you see a stern wheel towboat with a load of steel. Jones Lock and Steel Company is shipping La Chile steel west on the river. It's great at carrying ten miles ship. It's just the cheapest way you can ship them. And as petroleum became more important because of the cars and because of other things with petroleum, they began to ship a lot of petroleum through the locks and dams, which created that year-round navigation we talked about. And a little later, as all this came to pass, by 1929, the 30s, the early 40s, most of the boats were gone, except for a few remaining ones, where there was no bridge, their ferry service went on, and occasionally they would carry on excursions on these boats. This is at Huntington, West Virginia. You'll notice all the ladies in their white dresses coming off of the wharf boat where they had been on perhaps a weekend to Cincinnati or a daylight excursion on the river. <coughs> but as the river changed, so did the boats that went on there. And this is a steel, propeller-driven propeller steamboat. Uh, it's interesting, the people on the river were slow to change, but when they did, they changed very quickly and they changed very heavily into this thing. This is the forefather, basically, of today's diesel powered And even during World War II, when the nation was at its height, working on keeping the world safe and at peace, it was used as a part of the campaign of the posters back then. You'll notice this is a stern wheel towboat the Duffy, which is, has sand barges ahead of it, but they're using it as a part of, may only ships of peace be born on our rivers. It's interesting because then they reverted to the river to begin to build some ships and boats on the inland waterways because the coastal waters of Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico were so dangerous because of Nazi submarines that they realized they could do it, build it here, get it shipped down to New Orleans and off from there 
So our rivers became significant in our war effort in World War II. They're actually launching a uh, mine tender here at Marietta Manufacturing at Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And this is a group of other military vessels being towed down river by an old-fashioned stern wheel steamboat, steamboat during the World War II. After the war, actually during the war and after the war, diesel-powered boats really became prevalent. Steamboats basically faded away, and this is what took their place. You see a 15-tow, 17-tow barge diesel tow boat coming up street, and this little five-barge, six-barge uh, petroleum uh, tow boat passing here. Now, the reason they're racing here is the new locks and dams had not been built on the Ohio at this point. And getting to the old locks and dams and taking anywhere from three to eight hours to lock through, they all would race up the river to see how quickly they could beat whomever it was ahead of them to get to the lock chamber. Uh, this is taken uh, above on the upper Ohio. It was a core photograph. This is screened up locks and dams. Today it looks much different than this because they have a little hydro power unit over here and a bridge over this portion of it. It was designed and built to have enough support to do a bridge. But I wanted to show you what the new locks and dams look like. In the early 1950s, the Corps of Engineers began to take out the old locks and dams that were numbered 46, and they've ended up building 15 of these. There's 16 planned from Pittsburgh to Cairo. But you'll notice the lock chambers are much bigger. The dams are fixed. They can't be lowered to let you go across them. They have gates, tanger gates or lower gates as they call them, to maintain a navigation <coughs> tool of nine foot from Cairo to Pittsburgh. That's a year-round nine foot navigation deck. <coughs> Having hit the Ohio, which is our most famous and probably our, our greatest river in West Virginia, We'll start up here at the Monongahela and head south. And to do this, we talk a little bit about the Monongahela River. This is one of the rivers that comes in at Pittsburgh and begins the Ohio. Uh, it's interesting, uh, I have friends, one of which is a very dear friend who believes this. He contends that the Ohio was actually a contingent of the Allegheny River. He says the Monongahela was just a tributary to the, Ohio, to the Allegheny, and the Allegheny was really all the way down through here. But the American Indian didn't think so, and the American, most of them didn't think so. They named it their own way, and they named it uh, what the Indians had called it, and that was the Ohio. The more interesting part about this is that the French, I think, named it best. They called it La Belle Riviera. Not a beautiful river, but the beautiful river. And today, I think the Ohio is still that way. So now that we've done that, we'll talk a little bit about the Monongahela. The Monongahela was a a really active river even before the steamboat was built. It was a place that where they built a lot of boats. Actually, it was actually the birthplace of American navigation on our inner rivers. Because flat boats, keel boats, all those shipping boats were built non-powered, were built somewhere near the Pittsburgh area, Brownsville, a a Elizabeth, and places like that. When the first steamboat left in 1811 from Pittsburgh to New Orleans, within five years, there was one running on the, on the Monongahela River. And that was also, in 1817, the legislature of Pennsylvania decided they'd survey the Monongahela for improvements, navigation improvements. So it'll give you some idea about how important navigation was during that period. As it turned out, and they began to do this, there were a lot of boats that came into being. And these boats were, as you see here, this is a typical calling card or advertising card for that area uh, of Pittsburgh and the Ohio River. It's more interesting that these locks and dams they built, this is lock and dam number one, which was actually rebuilt later, but it's, it's the lock and dam number one on the Monongahela River. And you'll notice it has a fixed dam, which means there's a concrete barrier there, and small lock chambers as well. But it did open the Monongahela and start navigation. The results were up at Elizabeth, they had boat guards that were building steamboats as quickly as they could. You'll notice one's on the way here, there's one being built here, there's one waiting here, and there's one right here. All these boats are a part of a fleet that's being built that now becomes so important to what is going on in the American waterway as we move west on the western frontier. Boats like this were, became fashionable on the Monongahela River. 
You will notice it's the Pittsburgh, Brownsville, and Geneva packet. And Pittsburgh, of course, then began to grow and develop what now everyone knows is the Smoky City. You will notice that there are boats lined all along the landings. There's all kind of activity going on on the wharf land. There's a towboat going downstream over here. So Pittsburgh was an absolute hub of a business and navigation improvements on the river. This is what the early locks of dams look like. You'll notice the dam is a fixed dam here with one small lock chamber. But they built 11 of these, 10 of these actually, on the river. And soon we have boats going from Pittsburgh to Morgantown, West Virginia, on the upper Monongahela. During the Civil War, they didn't build anything above the, the Pennsylvania line. But as soon as the war was over, the state of West Virginia appealed to the federal government to build locks and dams. And they began to do it. As a result, they later took over almost all the land lock and dam systems on all the rivers in America. Here you see an advertisement or a little booklet, actually, of the Monongahela River Packet Company. And you'll notice it goes to Morgantown, West Virginia. And this is what they look like operating. This is James E. Blair coming up the Monongahela River. Probably somewhere near the upper, uh, upper river, near uh, Morgantown or Fairmont or somewhere in that area. And yes, they were also anxious to get to the lock chambers. So much so that many of them would take a chance with each other to see who could get there first. It was sort of steamboat chicken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, this is the most unusual photograph. As a matter of fact, it's the only one I know of that actually shows this. The I.C. Woodward and the Elizabeth were both going towards this lock. Both were racing to get there first because they were carrying people on board who wanted to be ahead of the other boat, which was a little bit of steamboat racing going on. The results were they got wedged in here and neither captain would back off. <laughs> so they actually got the sheriff down there. The constable came down and he insisted on trying to get one of them to move and neither of them would back up. So he called one of the home offices of one of the boats, I don't remember which one, and appointed with the superintendent to make one of his boats back up. And sure enough, he made one of them back up. Probably the Elizabeth, because this guy has made the approach into the lock chamber as he should have. So I think probably the Elizabeth ended up back in. But anyway, to give you some idea of the competitiveness on the river, it was uh, a lot of fun, but very dangerous at times, but really competitive. I wanted to include this to show you, yes, they did get to Morgantown. This is the packet Columbia. This is Morgantown, West Virginia at its height. And uh, this, you see, is a steamboat showboat landed here with a little towboat on back end. We had navigation all the way up to Monongahela to Fairmont. But Pittsburgh was more than just a packet boat place. It was also the home of all a heavy, heavy towboat industry. You'll notice this is lined up for a parade they had there, but you'll notice all these are not packet boats, but tow boats. Tow boats that push barges. Gives you some idea of the activities in and around Pittsburgh in the 1820s, 1930s, up to the 1930s. And this is what they were doing towing coal up and down the river. And you'll notice these were steel mills that once lined the banks of Monongahela. This is one of uh, six locks and dams on the Monongahela River. This is a new modern project. Uh, the Corps of Engineers have built all of these, and they're still operating today. Uh, this is lock and dam number four on the Monongahela River. So with this, we move on into another river. And this time we'll come downstream to the Little Canal River. We're coming from the Nongahela down to the Little Canal. Keep in mind now these are all western flowing rivers. The Little Canal, of course, enters the Ohio at Parkersburg. I included this postcard because it shows you some idea about at the height of the uh, river industry in this period. These boats were very, these places were very active. You see the wharf boat here, a ferry boat going across stream. You see a Quarters boat, a boat where people live. And these are two towboats. This is towboat, this is a packet boat, landed at Parkersburg. The Little Canal, those of you who are familiar with that river, probably find it hard to believe that there's that much activity in those type boats there, but at one time there was. It's interesting, that boat, the, the boat started running up there shortly after the uh, New Orleans passed there, probably about the 1820s. And this is one of the very early packet boats, 1880, 1889, somewhere in that range. This is the W.A. Hilton. And it's landed somewhere on the upper Little Canal River, if you can believe it. 
this is a house, of course, this is uh, some farm here, but he has landed there. It's uh, pretty roughly treated, but at least it represents or shows what, what was going on. There. And this is a packet boat carrying freight and people up and down the river. And this is the French, another smaller packet boat that operated early on the Great Little Columbia River. You'll notice it says Parkersburg, Creston. And Creston is a small town on the Little Kamal River. And it was a packet boat as well. This is Lock and Dam 4 at Elizabeth that was built by the state and a private company. They built four locks and dams on the Little Canal at one point that were privately owned. By the 1880s, the federal government had begun to take uh, charge of those, and they built a fifth lock and dam that uh, took things up to as far as Burnsville. It's interesting, you'll notice those were fixed dams and, and uh, one little single lock chamber. But that was all the river would accommodate. This is a stern wheel boat. It is diesel or gas powered back here, chain driven, much like what you see some of the stern wheelers today. But that's what became, it became a gas boat river, they referred to it, because these little boats could maneuver way upstream. Not only were there packet boats, as you saw there, they were tow boats. Here again, a stern wheel, pallet, put it on, I want to say, Combustion engine powered there, right? And this is one of them too. This is the Chase. Those are students going to Glenville College on the, at Glenville, West Virginia. So the boats played an important role no matter what you thought they were doing on trade, on transportation, on carrying culture, on even carrying students to get an education. And they went further up, up to Big Root Shoal, which is not too far below Burnsville. And you'll notice five gas boats, little tow boats, running on very shallow water, but they were able to do that, and that's why they were so popular. Once they reached their destination, it may be another story of how they get them unloaded, but here we see a gas boat, the crane landed, unloading hay or loading hay one, and the uh, Model T Ford had to require two more horsepower to get it up. <laughs> As I said, the photographs of the river and riverboats are remarkably entertaining as well as education. Uh, it's remarkable what these little boats could do and did do. By the 1950s, unfortunately, the trades have just about died on the Little Kanoa, and the Little Kanoa was turned over back to the state of West Virginia. All the locks and dams are in disrepair now. So, Let's go on down the river and we'll come down to where we are tonight on the Great Kanoa River. The Great Canal River for West Virginia is its most significant within boundary river. It's the only river that's totally within the boundaries of West Virginia. And remarkably enough, it's only 99 miles long. It's 91 miles navigable. It has an unbelievable history because of its shortness, its smallness, but what it has done paralleling the American history. Uh, I know that some of you have mentioned tonight the movie The Great Canal, an American story. And the whole idea was to tell that story uh, that's been on PBS. And we were trying to let people know the importance of this one little small river. Through its lifetime, through its time when uh, the immigrants came, uh, Europeans got here, there have been three series of locks and dams on the river. There were wicked locks and dams. There was uh, 10 of them, not 11 of them. 10 of them. Later, there were three built, Winfield, Armet, and London. And since then, there have been extensions put on both Winfield and London, I mean Marmel. So in, through the history of the boat, over 200 years, they have done three improvements on the Little Canoe on the, quote, small Great Canoe River. To do this was a great thing because initially it had been a part of the dream of even George Washington that the James River Canal Canal and Turnpike be developed, taking us across the mountain into the Great Canoe River Valley into the Ohio River Valley and beyond there. And to do this, they actually began to create a canal in Virginia, coming up to Lynchburg, and then crossing it by a turnpike, coming down into the Canal River Valley to about Gauley Bridge, and then down the river on the boat. This was the whole idea. That's the reason they have Knoxville, Chattanooga, Nashville, and Memphis listed there. So you could go from Richmond all the way up and go all the way to Memphis if you follow the route. <coughs> this is very interesting because this was the 
the reason that the state of Virginia began to create means to protect and also to improve the Great Canal River. They took out shoals, boulders, and things like that to make sure that it would continue to be navigable year round. And one of the main reasons of this, of course, were the salt works. This is very early uh, cut <coughs> showing the salt works, and here you'll notice the furnaces are all burning to dry the salt. This was a significant import or export out of the Canal River Valley to basically the rest of the world. The importance of salt back then has always been underestimated. It was used for so many things, but predominantly to cure meat and to season things. And without that, there was, little, there was a lot of spoilage on things. So the salt became a significant impact on it. And the salt springs just above us here on the canal were so significant that this also led to coal in the development of coal industry in the valley and also was a means by which the boats could operate. This is one of the very earliest photographs. Actually, it's pre-Civil War. This is the Canal Vale taken in Buffalo by a Dr. Pitrat, Pitrat, a Frenchman who was the postmaster, the door, store owner, uh, photographer, and the doctor, all in Buffalo. Uh, this is interesting because even prior to the Civil War, you'll notice the construction and the architect of the boat was virtually as we saw back in the 1830s. This is another one I want to include, taken again at Buffalo by the same doctor. Uh, it's very unusual to find two photographs so closely alike with one or two significant changes. This is the mountain boy. You'll notice the no whole name is here. This one, they've lifted the ventilation uh, cover, and now it's just mountain. And you'll have to figure it was boy because that was new. And it's in Buffalo. But you'll notice how low the river is here. The boat is actually stuck on the sandbar. He's trying his best to get off. That's the reason they had so much heat in the engine room down here that they had to open the vents. And of course, there were always tow boats on the river, tow boats carrying a lot of things, including salt barges. But here you see them on the upper Charleston ferry boat crossing, as it says on the, on the photo. Now, you see the ferry boat back here? These were two very early tow boats on the Canal River. And of course, they fleeted barges waiting for a water station to go down the river. A part of this whole idea of the James River Canal Canal and the development that went on with the Great Canal can be best attributed to after the Civil War. The nation itself, the U.S. government, decided they would create a water line from the blue water of the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the foothills of the Rockies. And to do this, they did the central water line, which would run from the Norfolk area up the James River, over the mountain, down the Kanawha, into the Ohio, all the way down to Cairo, up the Mississippi at St. Louis, actually St. Charles, St. Charles, and then turn up the Missouri, up the Kansas water line, all the way to the foothills of the Rockies. This never became a true uh, reality, but it was partially true because they began to have some success in all of this area here, as well as a little bit in this area. No locks or dams were ever built on the Missouri. Now, I talked about low water on the Great Canal River. This was a very poor postcard mounted or cardboard mounted photograph that I got. A guy gave it to me actually. It's most unusual because it's at Charleston. <coughs> This is a suspension bridge. They're actually dredging in the river here for a low stage of water. But even more interesting was what was written on the back of this card. For those of you who can't see it, he uses a lot of initials here, GBG. And GBB took a drive along the banks of the Great Canal River. Then they took this scene so that it would ever recall dear old Charleston, West Virginia, on September the 15th, 1904. That rickety old suspension bridge can be seen in the distance and after, question mark, we were safely across, it fell with a crash. <laughs> I left Charleston that night, the phone wouldn't tell its, question mark, secret, would it? And he signed it, I think that's EBB, but anyway, that was written on the back of that part of, the, uh, of this scene. So we know the suspension bridge supposedly fell after they crossed it.
Here's what the early locks and dams on the Great Canal look like. This is the wild goose in the lock chamber. You notice it, it's very new, it's lock and dam number four. And the dam runs right through here. We can't see it, but this is where they began to do improvements on the, uh, on the canal by building locks and dams. They had 12 planned and they built 10. And uh, unfortunately they didn't uh, number them properly, so number 11 became at the end of the river down at Point Pleasant. But this is the reason to, this is what a normal packet mining would look like back here. This is the Leroy, and they've made a farm mining. The more interesting part about this is that the practice back then was if the farmer wanted you to land, he would wave a white handkerchief to the boat captain or a lander at night, and they would come to shore, literally land like you see here, load or unload, whatever your product was. The relationship between the captains on these boats and the farmers along the way were significant. The captains would do something as simple as go to Cincinnati and pick out a spool of thread for a lady up here in the Canal River Valley if she would give him a sample. So that's what kind of relationship the boat captains carried on. <coughs> and of course, you'll notice this is printed by the Winfield Bargain Store. It's a postcard with the canal passing Winfield on it. So this is what the role they played. They, the boats were so important that they actually advertised them on their own bargain store advertising. And of course, at Point Pleasant, this became the significant point of pooling mass fleets of coal barges. All the mines along the Canal River Valley were producing coal, putting them in river barges, floating them down to Point Pleasant. There they would be pooled together, waiting for a rise in the river. Not just the Canal, because it had locks and dams, but the Ohio. If they got a rise, they all knew it, and the boats went out one after another. Just like you see here. This is a the Joe Cook, by the way, coming out of the Canal River. Here's another tow bit way ahead of it. They're going on down river with their coal, Cincinnati or beyond, maybe even the Memphis. And the coal tow boats they had on this river were treated with as much tender care and love as most of the packet boats were. This is a, a, a big boat of its own, E.R. Andrews. It was the first boat that had a wireless telegraph on it to communicate with back at shore. But you'll notice that there's banners on this thing and all the people on here. So obviously this is a Sunday excursion of a church group or a school group or a company picnic or something on this big tow boat on the Canal River. And of course, I hear stories and have for years about how significant it was these boats on the river and what they meant. You'll notice here the DT Lane, which is a 36 a year operating boat. But you'll notice, look at the canoes and all the bobbing heads out here wanting to ride the waves on the back of these tugboats. Uh, I think I counted 26 heads in here at one time. These guys right here are waiting for the boat passes so they can ride the waves. And believe it or not, this is the Sonoma. She was on her way to a circus at Charleston. I want to get my facts right here. On May the 13th, 1889, the Sonoma started at Montgomery, West Virginia, and made 82 landings in 26 miles to Charleston, taking people to the circus. And what you see here are the circus goers. This picture was made at the landing at Charleston. So yes, the boats were important, very much so to people, for more than just carrying on commerce. This is a blotter. I always thought this was something else because uh, Senator Cordell operated here in the 30s and was quite the boat. But at Pittsburgh to Charleston, Senator, Senator Cordell, ideal river vacation. So a little advertising that goes a long way. And this is the Liberty. 1936, the Liberty towed the wharf boat at Charleston out here. She was the last operating packet boat on the inland waters of the Ohio and the Canal River system. She was the last packet, basically, on the inland waterways. And some of you may remember this. This was during World War II, and shortly before that, when they were doing work at the nitro plant down at Nitro. You'll notice it says Charleston Nitro Transportation Company. And this was actually used as a ferry boat on weekends used as an excursion boat. And of course, our capital was built right on the river. <coughs> At one time, they've covered them up now. At one time, they had steps that walked right down to the Canal River. 
And so people coming in there on boats could actually walk up the steps to the Capitol from the river. They have since put a wall up there. But this gives you a good eye insight into the importance of the river coal to the state of West Virginia. In the 1930s, they rebuilt, took out all those uh, wicket blocks and names we saw with Amanda Wild Goose in the block chamber, and created three new blocks and dams. All three had power supply, hydro power units on one side, and had double lock chambers. This is the E.D. Kenna towboat approaching the lock chamber there. By the 1980s and 1990s, things had changed so significantly on the river. Transportation was so good on the Great Canal River. This is a drawing of what they built the canal at Winfield. This, you'll see the power plant here, fixed dam, the old lock chambers, and this new canal, which is 1,200 feet long, larger, but 900 feet long, larger lock chamber. There are now two of those. The Marmette has the same thing, and they continue to be one of the more successful rivers in the nation. So we live from the Great Canal to a river that is a part of the Great Canal system, and that's the Coal River. Thanks for coming, Brooks. Uh, on the Great Canal, there's the Elk River, but there's also the Coal River, and it was a river that required our headlocks and dams as well. You'll see this early map here that shows the Canal and Coal River coal region. You'll know the big Coal River going up through here, and here goes the Canal. These rivers were so important to each other because they were significant in what happened on them. Channel Coal was discovered on the Coal River. By the way, the Coal River was named in 1852 or 1753 or something like that because of the coal findings and coal tails along the river. But the important part about it was it had Channel Coal supplies along the way. Channel Coal was what was later refined into what we call coal oil. Many of you may remember lanterns were fired by coal oils. And this is where that great deal came from. A series of six locks and dams were built on the main lock, on the main stem of the Coal River, and one lock A on the Little Coal River. Uh, Little Coal. This is the only known photograph of any navigation improvements or boats on the Coal, uh, Coal River. This you see a lock chamber and a boat's in the chamber here. These are floating units, probably some kind of uh, uh, trade boats that were tied off here, probably barges or floating boats concrete dam, but this is the only one. But to give you some basic idea of what it's like on the Coal River, boats like this probably ran in there. This is a big sandy packet, but it could very well have ran on the Coal River. You'll notice the oil lamps here that they covers up. But you'll notice how shallow it is even in the coal, in the big sandy. The coal must have been much like that because I have a feeling this is what Coal River probably looked like back then. And you'll notice boats here. This again is the big Sandy Valley, but the Coal Valley must have looked much like this. That trade went on to well after the 1880s when finally there were some floods and things happened in the Coal River. And in 1861 there was a major flood in this area, which also did significant damage to all this. If we move on down the river, we go to a river that's close to where I grew up part of where I live now is Huntington. And there, yes, there were locks and dams on the Guyandock River. Now, if any of you know the Guyandock and see it, you're wondering to yourself how possibly that could be. But there were six locks and dams built on the Guyandock River. Of those six, uh, all were lost in the 1861 flood that hit this area, but they were built crib dams. And you'll notice there's tolls on here because it was privately owned. To give you some idea of what may have happened there, they had push boats on the upper guy and up, which were very important to the trade in that valley area and to the Huntington area for years. They carried out a lot of things and carried things back up the uh, guy and up. And yes, there were small boats built off right on there too. This one is actually named the guy and up. It's one of those little back wing boats, side wheel exposed boats. If you'll notice, there's actually an even smaller boat on the outside of this boat. And they're loaded down with water bottles. And this is the true guy in God. At one time, there was so much pristine virgin forest in the guy in Valley that they were major log rafts coming in. You'll see here, these are all logs jammed in at guy in God, the town of guy in God. All these guys are trying to work the thing, figure out how to break the jam. These gentlemen, of course, 
are just enjoying themselves on a Sunday afternoon, walking across the guy in Dock River. You'll notice there's marks on the end of these logs, and those were the marks of the owner of the logs, because when they fluttered them down the river, many of them just came as a big group. So this is the uh, guy in Dock town, the sawmills along the guy in Dock uh, itself. The river was like this. And even as late as the 1920s, it appears they used to tie the log grass to were evident near the Inco plant in Huntington. You'll notice there's a couple out here on a nice sunny afternoon with her with her uh, son brother. So logging was a big industry too, and a great industry for the state of West Virginia, uh, and the rivers played a significant role in that. Oops. The next we'll go down to is the final river, the Big Sandy. Uh, this is one of my favorite rivers for many reasons. Uh, it had boats operating on it prior to the Civil War, uh, both push boats and uh, early steamboats. This is the actually the junction that created when the Levisa Fork goes on up to Pikeville, Kentucky. This is the Tug Fork, which goes along, sets our boundary at West Virginia, but also goes as far up as Warfield or even maybe Williamson. And yes, boats did run there. And again, I've got to pay homage to this guy right here, the picture gallery guy is getting ready to take some pictures of that area, which he may have taken of this scene. The most interesting part to me about this is, this is a wharf boat at Lavisa, or Louisa, Kentucky, which you cannot imagine on the big sand. But this was the first early navigation on there. You'll notice these push boats even were so affectionately thought of, this one's called Sunshine, loaded with numerous barrels of apples or whatever. Later, these side wheel boats called Batman boats because the exposed paddle wheels look like bats flapping their wings. Very light on water, could run on 18 inches of water or less, but they could carry great commodities things up and down the river. And sometimes, of course, they would put in tow these push boats, barges along the way, and carry things as well. You notice the exposed back room here. This is 1895 on the Big Sandy River. And here became the industry after the boats stopped running, or even sometimes while the boats were still running. You'll notice this is a huge log raft going downstream, but there's one, two, three, four, five huge log rafts going downstream down the Big Sandy. This is actually a Big Sandy river. You'll also notice again the markings at the end of the logs. These are all dogged together, as they call it. And they came down and had sweeps on the front as well as the back. And these guys literally lived on the boat long enough to get it down to the capital. And this is how they did it. They cut the logs on the property up there, built a splash dam, they called it, which was a very crudely built structure, built to be trippable. You notice the stands here. And they float the logs in behind all this and pull them there. And then they would trip the dams, and this would create a flow of water down through, a flood of water actually, carrying all the logs down there. This was done all over the streams above the Big Sandy, and here's what the results were. This is at Catlinsburg, Kentucky. These were later shipped downstream, some of the finest hardware in the world at that point, used for all kind of purposes, including building future boats. <coughs> And they built three locks and dams on the Big Sandy. There's 27 miles between the Ohio River and the confluence of the uh, Tug and the Levisa Fork. This one has a 21-foot lift on it. This is lock and dam number one. You'll notice the Enquire tow boat, packet boat, coming down through the river. There was one lock and dam each built on the Tug Fork and on the Levisa Fork. And again, I had to include one more picture. This is the Eureka photo boat. You'll notice the skylight here. But this luxurious boat towing it here is the E.D. Kerper, and it's a little sternable boat. Didn't even have a pilot house, but he has a boom suite back here to guide the boat. And of course, this shows you what really happened at the end of packet boating and steam boating on the Big Sandy River. Here we see the little Fialca boat going downstream. By the way, I must tell you the story about the Fialca. It's a most unusual name. Uh, Green Meeks. Had a daughter named Elka. He built a boat and he told the painter, I want the boat called the Elka. And the painter painted the Elka. And, and so it became the Elka. 
And believe it or not, on the Big Sandy River, almost to Paintsville, there's a little town called Fielka and has a U.S. post office. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I wanted to show you this particularly because as evolution of everything happens, as transportation changes, we begin to see a lot of things. But these almost doomed most steamboats on the American rivers, railroad tracks. And no, funny enough, they built the railroads right beside the rivers, which a lot of rivermen took great numbers about. So. so as we bid farewell to the steamboat era, and to the rivers. I'll give you one more idea about people and their love for the river. Here we see an actual photograph I took in Huntington about oh, eight or ten years ago of a father and his son and another man floating down the Ohio on a log ramp. They're standing in water, folks. This thing did not have enough buoyancy to stay up, so they actually were barefooted standing on the water in the logs. They were on their way to Cincinnati, hoped to get further. And I don't know if they ever made it past Portsmouth, to be truthful with you. I would have been very dubious about doing that, but they, you know, the Tom Sawyer, Mark Huckfin, life still lives in many people's hearts. And I include the Bell Hood. She is one of the last operating steamboats on the American waterways, and next year, in Mobile, Kentucky, she will celebrate her 100th birthday. That's most unusual for any boat, let alone a steamboat. She's a beautiful boat, built in Pittsburgh, and she'll be 100 years next year, 100 years old next year. You can still go to Louisville, and you can still take daylight excursions on her, or moonlight excursions on her, and it's well worth it. The engines on this boat are older than the boat, and we're not sure how old they are. But she's kept up well. The city of Louisville and the county down there, Jefferson County, really, really love this boat and take care of it. So again, I would invite you to do that sometime. If you have questions, I'll be more than happy to try to answer them for you. And I do have, I'll do my commercial now. Uh, I do have some tapes that I produce. One is called Tested by Time to Become an American Legend, the Steamboat Delta Queen, which is a, an hour-long history of the Delta Queen. Uh, I like to refer to it as a comprehensive history. Another one is 200 Years of Steamboating, which I did in 2011, which celebrates, uh, it's a half-hour-long DVD celebrating 200 Years of Steamboating on the American Waterways. And one last book for <coughs> my head, which is actually the companion book for the, the DVD. So with that, I will. So the Akiani was part of the uh, tributary of the, of the uh, Monongahela. Okay. They built three locks and dams on it. And it was a very high producer of timbers and coal. So it was a very popular river also. The locks and dams got damaged and later destroyed by flooding. They never rebuilt them. This was in the 1860s, after the Civil War, I believe maybe before the 1850s, 1860s. So the Yonkahaney was a, a new guy from the area. His name was Sandbar Johnny Zinn, and he lived on the Yonkahaney and let everybody know it. So, yes, sir? Was the uh, Alan Louisville, was that the Avalon? It was the Avalon, it was the Idle Mile, the Avalon, and the Bell of Louisville. And it used to make frequent stops up here in Charleston as the Avalon, as the excursion there. As a matter of fact, one of its early, well, long-term captains is Captain Clark C. Doc Hawley, if any of you know Doc Hawley or the Hawley family. Doc's retired now, but he started out as a popcorn popper and calliope payer on the Avalon here in Charleston. <laughs> Very close friend. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, ma'am. My grandparents were, from record, were married in Galapagos. They came to Charleston Cross Lanes. How would they have gotten to Galapagos? In 1878. 78. Well, that's very possible. That could have been seen, but and probably was, by the way. They had gone down the canal, up the Ohio, to Galapagos, because there was a lot of traffic carried on then. There were short-run lines back then. There were people who ran boats from Charleston to Montgomery. That was one route. Charleston to Point Pleasant. Charleston to, to Galapagos. So there were a lot of short-run runs. And coming out of the river and going down to Galapagos, was not unusual because that kind of place was a, a commerce center at that time as well. So there were a lot of boats that actually ran that route. But could they have crossed a ferry? Very, oh, yes, very possible. Well, yes, sir. there's no question that's true because there were ferries at Galapagos and ferries at Point Pleasant, both across the canal and the uh, And of course, there were all kinds of ferries here in Charleston, particularly one here in Charleston. Was one of the reasons they say the railroad came here was the ferry crossing. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any more information on the mountain boy? 
Only what you'll find in Fred Way's steamboat. Uh, it's interesting, historically, you begin to look these things up, and sometimes you'll find bill of ladings on this boat, or a log book that says something about it. But as to the ownerships and things like that, you, know, you almost have to go back to some of the uh, documenting for sources. At one time, which was one was in Weed, but to find this thing, or find someone who has a lot of information on this. Well, uh, I don't know if I brought that with me or not. I know the Chesapeake was used. I know the Immigrant was used. I know uh, the, uh, um, the boat. something Prince. Anyway, I don't think the I don't think the uh, Mountain Boy was used in that. I don't think so. I'll check it and let you know if you'd like. If you find Fredway's directory, it will tell you that. Also, I think in it's uh, Ways Packet Directory. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, Jim just told you what you need to know. Anyway, there's also in my book, a sermon was on the Great Canal. I think there's a fair write up on the Mountain Boy as well, where I found the information probably out of Fred's book, but other sources as well. Yes, sir. Are there any commercial books that you can get on, like in Louisville and, and uh, travel down? There's one boat, well, no, there's two boats, I'm sorry, two boats operating now. One is the American Queen. She's a Sternwell steamboat, power assist, but she is the boat today. Um, the Delta Queen is tied up in Chattanooga, will probably never run again. The Mississippi Queen no longer exists. Uh, the River Barge Line it landed here at Charleston sometimes. The River Explorer no longer exists. She's tied up. The other is the Queen of the Mississippi, which is a uh, hydrologic, hydro-powered sternum mill boat that looks like a river boat. I've never been on it. Never, well, I've seen it one time. That's the only ones I know that are still operating <coughs> for overnight passengers. Right. Now, in New Orleans, you can ride the Natchez on an excursion boat. Honest to God, full-fledged sternum mill steamboat. Beautiful boat. Yes, sir. I have a diary of S.B. Campbell, who was the first president, president of the Purchase National Bank of Montgomery. He lived in Long Acre, and he kept this diary in 1887 and 88. He says in that diary that the Canora River rose 40 feet in three days. He also says that he went to Frederick, West Virginia, and I have no idea where Frederick, West Virginia is. It's got to be, on, it's got to be in the Montgomery area somewhere. Well, I can't help you with the latter with it all, but it is conceivable before the Bluesville, Sutton, I mean Bluestone, Sutton, Summers, all those deposits, it is conceivable under some of the storms that pass up this valley, the 40 feet would be accepted. It's, uh, in, in, in 1861, they had a horrendous flood came through here, storm had carried on, damaged the locks and dams on the, on the Cayandot, on the Coal River, on the Big Sandy. So, I mean, uh, structures on the big scene. So, it's, it's feasible, yes. Yes, Jim? Two things. <clears throat> I've always heard there was Hawk and Dams on the Elk River. I've only been able to confirm one of them. In the chief reports, when I say chief report, there's used to be the Corps of Engineers, chief of engineers required every district to send him a report at the end of each year. And this was incorporated into a volume of books and they're called the chief reports, and they're every year. They make reference to a lock and dam at the mouth of the Elk River, which was removed quickly after they first started again developing and doing improvements on the uh, canal. So yes, there was. And the other thing, he mentioned floods. My dad took a rowboat up and down Capitol Street <laughs> in 1893 or 4, somewhere. It's interesting what the river giveth, the river taketh away if we're not real careful with it because the flooding was a major issue, still is in most places in the state, but the big rivers also felt that as well. So it was not unusual. I want to tell you one thing to make sure you understand this. 
Locks and dams are not flood control projects. They do not retain or hold flood waters. As a matter of fact, if you've ever noticed when there's flood waters occurring, they'll roll the gates completely out of the river, and the river will pass through. So they are not there for flood control. They are strictly there to maintain a nine-foot navigable depth for a navigation pool. That's a misconception that hundreds, thousands of people still don't believe. Yes? It's kind of a minor point, but I'm figuring the, since they were steam boats, they had to generate steam with coal. And if you get to see those coal piles, how they do these boats? If you look at the head of the boat on the forecastle on that area, they would wheel the boat's coal in there or up into the side. But most of the time, you had a coal buffer somewhere on the boats. Even the packet boats used to pile coal right on that, that forecastle and wheel it back to the boilers. It's, it's interesting, when the New Orleans went downriver in 1811, uh, two years before that, uh, Livingston and Roosevelt had taken a barge down the river and they stopped at Pomeroy and opened a coal mine. And actually the boat to 1811 stopped there to get coal because wood was used for years and years. As a matter of fact, along the rivers and particularly in the Mississippi, the river, the road, woods the forests were stripped for miles back carrying wood down to feed the boilers of the boats. So then they converted the coal and then diesel, internal combustion engines. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier that there are there there were ten locks and dams on the canal, yeah. and um, and number eleven is at Point Pleasant, number two is at Montgomery. Yes. So was the plan for there to be a number one further yes. up towards the falls? Yes. As a matter of fact, they started out they were going to build twelve, then they eliminated twelve altogether, and then they were going to build eleven, and number one was going to be built, but they realized when they got up that far, they were just about out of navigation water because of stomach. So they only built 10. And many people today will you know, tell me, oh no, there were 11 locks and dams on the canal because number 11 was at Point Pleasant. Yes, it was. But number two was at Montgomery, and that was the first one. So it used to be an interesting thing. A lot of people would uh, go above number two up here at Montgomery on some of the steamboats to see how far they could go, like up to Boomer, and turn around, see how far they could go up the Great Canal. And, and were they built from the Ohio up, or were they built from number two down? No, number three and four were built first, and then I think they built uh, six next. So they were built at different places, depending on where they were, I guess, in relation to water pools and so forth. And of course, one of the main reasons they built them down below uh, Red House, because Red House Shoal is the major obstacle on the river back then. Red House Chute, Red House Shoal. Yes, ma'am. Just how dangerous were the steamboats? I've heard that they were. Well, that's a common thing, and there were explosions, just like there were explosions on everything else and fires and everything. So you, I think you have to take into consideration, as I said earlier, the technology of the time wasn't just oriented towards the steamboats. Metal technology was playing a role with these metal boilers and metal instruments of, and, and tools and equipment. But also, steam gauges were coming in the boat. So they were using those. So many times, yes, but a lot of it was not caused by people racing or overpowering the steam engines. A lot of it was the fact they were sucking water out of the river to feed the boilers, which they would heat up. And there would be sand settlements and stuff that would come in there. And they would plug up the tubes and therefore create a boil or a bubble or, and it would blow up. So yeah, there have been. But then again, there are train wrecks, car wrecks, airplane crashes. So I never look upon this something else. There were a lot of, uh, how you say it? Uh, excitement writers back then who really did a lot with these uh, steamboat like explosions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, anything like that with a fire and that much pressure could be dangerous, even today. By the way, steam power is really much in vogue today. That's how we have these lights burning. By the way, that's where all the coal goes to burn to create uh, heat, to heat the boilers, to turn the turbines. And if we don't have that, we're going to be in the dark. Yes, sir. What, what ever happened to the J.M. White? The, big boat? the J.M. White was the ultimate packet boat on the Mississippi River. She was big, she was beautiful, she was expensive, and she was so well outfitted that it was unbelievable that people would spend that much money. Within about a five year period, she caught on fire and burned. And she was destroyed. 
And there's all kind of rumors even today about the fact that uh, she was burned for insurance. Because a lot of people got chairs and china and silverware and so forth from the JM White. So there's always those stories that go with these things, like with everything else. Yes, sir. Well, in the old pictures you see on the river, you see a lot of house folks. A lot of people live on the house. house folks, and they From about 1900 to the 1940s, actually the 1950s, shanty boats were very much in vogue. The Depression saw a lot of them. But a lot of people just wanted to live there. There's a great history of that on the shanty boat written by Harlan Hubbard. It's a nice book to read. And he and his wife lived off of the land. Their whole life, by the way. Uh, she was an artist, so was he. He was, uh, played the cello. She played the piano. He was a painter. She was a painter. And they ended up shanty boating, and he wrote books. And Harlan was quite the character, as she was, Anna was. I had the pleasure of meeting him one time. And uh, their collection, his art, is at the Hanover College in Hanover, Indiana, which is right across from where he lived there at uh, Paint Island. <coughs> Jeez, my mind's working well, but like, hit me while I'm hot. <laughs> yes, sir. They had shallow water there, but would they ever do any dredging? Oh, yes, dredging was very much in vogue for most of the early time. They would go through because the rivers were so heavily laden with silt and boulders. You know, it was a natural river. There were stumps everywhere, there were boulders everywhere, and a lot of sandbars. So one of the earliest means of trying to improve rivers was to go out and remove the boulders either by blowing them up or dragging them out of there, taking out snags by snag boats, which were, I could have gotten into tonight, but I just didn't have enough time, or I would have killed you with time. But uh, <laughs> then they, they, they did a lot of dredging too, to cut channels in the road. And they blew them out with a uh, diamond. Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, those were normally dragged and dragged down to a point and they were taken to a sawmill because there was no major river upon which to convert them. That's the reason the guy in Dot, the Elk, and the Great Pinot, uh, the Big Sander, all had huge force around it and they could float it into the rivers and get it down the street. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, yes, sir. You, you mentioned on a guy out there logging lots of dams and boating. Did all those things take place simultaneously? No. The, the early boats were built off of log crib dams. You know how a log house is built, stacking logs? Well, they used to build these dams that way, fill them full of rock, and then put boards along the front to create a dam, a stationary dam. And then they had one lock. Uh, unfortunately, on the on the guy and dog, they were not built with much uh, hydrological knowledge. And they actually built lock four and built lock three below it, and the pool would not reach lock four. So they built lock five between three and four to create <laughs> enough pool to get to the other. Well, you know, with uh, with things coming along going as bad as they were. I, I, by the way, I have a friend in Huntington here, his great grandfather kept a diary on the guy. And he talks about the boats running up and down the river there and where they were and going up to this or going up to Barbersville or so forth, up to the falls he would refer to. But those dams were had to be maintained. If they were not maintained, they began to deteriorate very, very quickly. And unfortunately on the guy and they didn't. And like I say, in 1861, this major storm swept through this whole area and literally washed them out. Nothing was ever done after that. There were some minor attempts, but no repairs to that's when, the started. That's when the logging started because they wait for a rise in the river from my hometown of Mullins area, Pineville, Logan, and float it downstream. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about naming of the locks and dams. Yes. Like at Winfield, we say Winfield Lock Dam, Winfield Lock Dam, Winfield Lock Dam, and then the Lock Dam is on the owner side. And I live where Old Lock <coughs> Dam used to be. Yes. It's called Bancroft, and I live in Winfield. Well, the government had the tendency uh, to do that with projects. And what they would do, they would, when they were planning it, they may have planned the lock on the other side of the river and therefore named it whatever it was on that side of the river. Uh, it was not uncommon uh, to name one to the nearest post office either. So wherever the post office was. Uh, there's a story about Somersville uh, that 
all of you probably have heard it one time or another, when they were going to build Summersville, the nearest post office to the site they chose was Gad, West Virginia. But they decided prudently not to name it Gad and Dean. So it became Summersville later. And that's a true story, by the way. Yes, sir. Well, come in on a question. I grew up in the northern panhandle, and there, there were, when I was real young, there were locks and dams in New Cumberland, the town I grew up in. When they put in the new locks and dams upstream, it's not even, you know, it's three or four miles north of New Cumberland, they still call it the New Cumberland mm -hmm. Dam Locks and Dam, even though the the locks are on the other side of the river, on the Ohio side of the river. Right. So sometimes well, I think they got named based upon an old lock and dam. And Hannibal's right down below there, and that's on the Ohio shore. New Martinsburg is right, New Martinsville is right there beside. It's interesting how these things happen, and today in modern times, too many of them, and I hate to say this and be critical, are being named for politicians. Uh, you know, not to be, you know, disrespectful. But I still think they should be named for the towns or where they are because. You know, if I were to say, uh, there's one on the lower Ohio something, I can't even remember the name now. If I say that, it wouldn't mean anything to you. It really doesn't mean anything to me, because, but if I'd say Paducah or some town near there, it would mean something to you. More questions? Jim? Put out a plug for Mary Ellen. Oh, uh, Jim belongs to an organization that he and I both belong to. It's called Sons and Daughters of Pioneer River. It's been in existence since 1938. I refer to it as America's Riverboat Historical Society. Uh, and for years they published a wonderful magazine. They still do. It started 50 years ago, as a matter of fact, by Captain Frederick Way, Jr. And it's still being published. It's a quarterly. And it's a pictorial uh, treat for anyone who has an interest in river riverbeds. What Jim is referring to is Point Pleasant, uh, under long-term arrangements, people down there wanted a river museum, and finally they got it with a lot of perseverance on a lot of people's part, and a lot of sacrifice on a lot of people's part. And today, if you really want to go see a nice museum, and I didn't mean that sincerely, uh, go to Point Pleasant. There's a lot of artifacts there and a lot of things there that I think will and enforce a lot of what I said today and help you really re appreciate what went on. Uh, we're, we're living in a riverine society whether people want to recognize it or not. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Betty McGarvin and I have a, an exhibit at the River Museum right now of photographs that were taken in 1943. And when we opened the exhibit on Friday, Jack Fowler gave us a tour of the simulator. And I just wanted to mention that because I don't think a lot of people know about it. What she's referring to on the second floor of the Point Pleasant Museum is a navigation towboat simulator. The real thing. This is not a toy, folks. This is the real thing. AEP, Appalachian Power, donated to the museum. You go in and you're standing at the controls of a towboat, not a diesel towboat. And you can change the program, by the way, or change where you're going on the river. You can change speeds. You can do a whole lot of things there. It'll even give you the uh, queasy feeling sometimes of being on the river, uh, which is, you know, only because you're moving too fast with the screen. But it's if you really want to go through the experience of taking a boat up or down the river, go to Point Pleasant, go to the River Museum, and get up on the second floor and really enjoy that. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, a little bit of uh, Kanawha River modern day history is uh, my community Dunbar has been recently recognized as the city of sternwheelers. And uh, we have the only working day sternwheeler, the excursion boat, uh, on the Great Kanawha River that uh, operates out of Dunbar Landing right there at the foot of the, the old Dunbar Toll Bridge. And so if you ever, we, every Wednesday evening we go for a little sternwheel ride and look at the city, the, the community of Dunbar and all the sternwheel boats that reside in that area. So You undoubtedly remember the American Sternwheel Association. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I, I didn't know that myself, so thank you. Yes, yes sir. I know that uh, my time is up. Uh, if you have more questions, I will be here for a while. Uh, and if uh, you would like to, I guess, build us a good evening.
uh, giving us a very nice lecture tonight. And we'd like to thank you for coming and uh, sharing your time with us also. I'd like to remember, or uh, I'd like to encourage you to, uh, to remember that we have some upcoming lectures. And uh, I told two that's coming up in the, this month. There's uh, coming up in the next, in the following months, there's uh, several. If you look on our uh, website, uh, there'll be some information on those, and plus we have some handouts for those. Uh, there is some newsletters uh, from the archives and the little holders. If you'd like to take any of that material, please feel free to do so. And Jerry has some things over here on the table there. Uh, please avail yourself of that. Thank you very much. Is that right?